here we go. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so we're starting to speak concerning the role of the wife. It's going to be a 26-week... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's obviously one of those uh, studies that uh, we can't really give that much uh, practical information in, in uh, 50 minutes, but I'm going to do the best that I can to be of help to you and to share with you a little bit about what the Scripture says in two different passages and some cross-references concerning what it means to be a Christian who is a wife. And so last time we were together, we spent some time looking uh, at how husbands can, can demonstrate love for their wives. Because remember with me that when Paul was writing to the husbands in chapter 5 here in verse 25, he had simply said to the husbands to love their wives. And so because um, all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in one word, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, I was sharing with us as husbands last time that what God has called us to do is to learn to love our wives. And I spent time with you sharing about how we can love in a sacrificial way, how we can love in a way that sanctifies, how we can love in a way that cherishes our wife, that brings stability to the home. And it was all wrapped up with the... Uh, the element of understanding that the, the relationship of a man and a woman as is understood as the, uh, by a Christian as is presented to us in Scripture is that the husband and the wife, the uh, marriage is really a picture of, of Jesus Christ and the church. And so I spent time with you last time speaking concerning this, how that we as husbands could learn to love in such a way. Because if we grow in these things, we may be able to minister effectively to our wives and we may be able to learn to be leaders in our home. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at how wives can demonstrate love for their own husbands. And as I've mentioned before, it's interesting to note that the Bible doesn't necessarily command wives to love their husbands. The Bible does speak concerning how the older women will teach the younger women how to love their husbands, but it seems that when it came to commands concerning love, well, the command to the husband was to love the wife, and yet the wife, it seems, does not receive that kind of command, but actually the command that she receives is the one that will demonstrate her love for her husband. And uh, you see that uh, in verse 33 of chapter 5, where it said, uh, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife, as himself, and then Paul went on to say, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so it would seem that the way that the man understands that his wife loves him is when the wife is showing respect for him. See that the wife respects her husband is the command. That word respect is a word that uh, means to treat with deference. It speaks of obedience. You see, a great example of this kind of attitude of respect can be found in the example of the wife of a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham is uh, the father of the, of the Jewish nation. And when she's referred to in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, Abraham's wife Sarah is said to have obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, that's a decision, this respect is a decision of the will. It requires dying to self, and it requires the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't fulfill the commands of God without, without God supplying the power to fulfill those commands. I mean, if you were to look at chapter 5 here, verse 18, it makes it very clear that it requires the power of the Holy Spirit when it says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So in order to be enabled to show the respect and reverence and all that is uh, commanded of, of our wives, that takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. And the wife is to respect the husband. She can show respect in a variety of ways. 
She can respect him as the leader of the home, uh, uh, the one who has been vested with authority by God to be the leader. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul said it like this. He said, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. It speaks concerning a chain of authority that was established and man has been given the responsibility of having authority in the home. She can respect him working the way that he works to provide for the home. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, If anyone doesn't provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. She can respect him as a man, and she can show that she's aware of the differences between her and her husband. You know, in a time when there seems to be this kind of like a, a well, you choose your own gender mentality that is being thrust on Americans, the Bible makes it very clear that God created them male and female. And there are quite obvious differences. And there are those, of course, and you'll especially find this in the uh, levels of academia, in, in schools and colleges and, and all, how there's a, an entire agenda being presented to, to the students there that basically are, are saying that men and women are exactly the same. They make choices as to whether or not they want to live as a man or a woman, etc. But, but, you know, these are usually theories that are given by people who don't have children. I mean, anybody here who's got any kids would dispute that immediately just by life experiences. I mean, I've got two boys and two girls, two men and two women now. I've got six granddaughters and two grandsons. And I can tell you, there are differences between boys and girls. You guys know this. I mean, you take your sons out, we'll say, to the park, and they're four years old, five years old, and you let them play, and there are trees in various places that they can run and play and all. You got three or four little boys. And what do they do? They're going to go find a stick, and they're going to hit each other. That's what they do, right? I mean, that's what they do. They play. We used to call it playing army. But you just would play. That's what boys do. They wrestle, they fight, they pick up sticks, and they chase each other. But you take four or five little girls of the same age, you put them in the same park, you put them near the same tree, and what do they do? The little girls will sit down in a circle, and they'll talk about the little girl who's not there. That's what <laughs> girls can do. <laughs> oh, I'm lying, I'm lying. She thinks she's so cute. Look at her ponytail. I don't like her ponytail. Of course, I'm playing with you, but there's truth to that. There's truth to that. The socialization, the identification, it's just entirely different. We know that. We know that little boys are not little girls, and little girls are not little boys. And, and what the woman does is she learns to show respect for the man as a man. It is not her job to be his, his mother. I remember when Marie and I, my wife and I, were first married, and Marie was doing what wives can do, you know, helping me choose everything. It's amazing how I did not know how to dress until I got married. <laughs> but uh, how we had uh, conversations, and Marie was doing what, what women can do, and I still remember it very early in our marriage, how I said to her, you know, I really, I didn't want to marry my mom. I wanted to marry a wife, and what you're trying to become to me is my mother, and I frankly already have one. So why don't we have a marital relationship? So from the very beginning, and I have to tell you, it wasn't some kind of evil plot on her life to, to ruin mine. It was just the way she by nature is. She wants to care for it. She wants to love. She wants to nurture. And I'm good with that. I enjoy it. I like being spoiled like any other man does. But at a certain point, I'm a man. You can't treat me like I'm one of your girlfriends. You can't sit down and make me watch Lifetime with you. I ain't gonna do it. Unless, unless you know, I, I never do it. I just can't do it. God's word somewhere says, thou shalt not watch Lifetime. <laughs> and I won't. But you know, she has to, she respects you in that way. She understands that there's a difference between this man and a woman. And 
And another way that I think is very important is she reveals her respect when she speaks well of him before children, her children, and when she speaks well of him before other people. When she actually speaks well of him, like it says in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, how, how she says, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She speaks well of him. She speaks well of her husband in such a way that he is even honored by other people because of the way she respects him. You see, I've said this every time I teach on this particular passage, that a man doesn't spell the word love, L-O-V-E. The way the word love is spelled for a man is the word respect. Because when my wife is respecting me, my wife is loving me. When my wife disrespects me, I take it personally, and I feel she is not loving me. And so the woman shows her respect in a variety of ways. She respects his leadership. She respects the fact that he works to provide. She respects that he's a man, and she respects him in front of other people, and it causes him to understand that he is loved. And the result can be that he has love and he has concern for his wife. In Proverbs 31, verse 11, it says, uh, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. In this action of respect and love for the husband, his trust is given to her, and he blesses her as a result of that. And so that's what Paul is going to be teaching us. Uh, he's going to teach the wife that she respects her husband, reverences him. And, and I want to point out in verse 22 that this really isn't a suggestion. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It's a command. It isn't that he's saying it would be great if you did this. He is saying that you are to do this, that the wife is to respect the husband. The wife is to submit to that husband. So Paul is addressing Christian wives. Now, the woman who is not a Christian would not listen to what Paul is writing. But the Christian woman would be greatly interested and she desires this kind of instruction. And so basically, Paul is giving two commands. One, he's saying, wives, submit to your own husbands. You see that in verses 22 and 24. And then secondly, in verse 33, he is saying, reverence or respect your husband. Now, obviously, and I'll lay a, a foundation so we can see this as clearly as, as is possible. Obviously, this portion of Scripture creates a bit of controversy Many women rebel against the command that they are to actually submit to their own husbands. Um, a few years ago now, probably at least two years ago now, Marie and I were walking in one of the local stores. And as we were walking, in front of us, to, to, I still remember, to, to my left, it was a, a, a guy in his late 40s probably, and a younger man in his early 20s. And you could see that they were engaged in conversation, and they both worked at this store. So as I was walking towards them, this older man was speaking to the younger man, and the older man said to the younger man, I'll show you, I'll, I'll prove what I'm telling you is true. And because he was right there, I heard him say that, I'll show you, I'll prove what I'm saying is true. So he says, excuse me, and he stops Marie and me. He says, may I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, of course. He says, in an argument, who wins? the woman or the man? And he asks me. So I go, well, who wins, honey? No, I, I <laughs> you tell me, you tell me, I don't know. Um, I said, in an argument, who wins? And he said, yeah. I said, I do. And he says, uh, and he, so he looks to Marie, does he? And Marie says, yeah, he does. Now, it's not that we're arguing. The question that he was asking really related to leadership. That's really what he was asking. Who leads in the home? I heard that in that way, because Marie and I, and, I, and this may sound weird to you, but some of you, who, you who've been married longer, you, you know what I'm trying to say when I say it this way. It, it's not that Marie and I don't have differences of opinions. Of course we do. Those are part of every marriage. 
but she has learned how wrong she can be when it differs with mine. No, she, oh, we have learned how to get along. So it's not like we have lots of arguments, because we don't, that's a fact. It, it, we, we, we just don't, we're, n- we're not always at each other. We're not. Those are things that we learned to settle in the first few years of our marriage. We learned how to get along. We learned what was important, what's not important, what's worth going to the mat for, what's not. You learn that over time. Everything doesn't have to be fought over. You know this. I'm not saying anything that you don't know. You don't have to argue about everything. The toilet roll paper, does it go this side or that side? You know, what side of the bed do you sleep on? I've discovered that's a sign. It's somewhere in the Bible. You sleep on this side. I discovered that. But you don't have to argue about everything, right? So when he said argument, Marie and I process that different because it's not like we argue. So because we don't, what, what we do is we do have conversations that get loud. No, we do have conversations over things, but it's just not that important at the end of the day. There are very few things worth actually getting really upset about. And when that does happen, we converse in, in volumes of, 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 of our, you know, our, our language. Volume isn't loud. We're not yelling. We're not getting mad. We're not arguing. We just don't do that. It just is it's not profitable to do that. With that said, when he said, who wins the argument, I really saw that more of a question is, who's the leader in the home? And I said, I am. And when he said, is that true to her? Marie said, he is. And that's unusual for many people today because after I said that to the man, he, he, he had such a puzzled look in his eyes. And he turned to the young man and he said, well, that's unusual. That's not, that's not normal. <laughs> that's what he said. You know? But in fact, that's how God designed it. That's how I'm supposed to be the leader. I'm supposed to be able to make the decisions. I'm supposed to be respected by my wife. I'm supposed to live in a way that she respects me, but even when I'm not living in that way, she is still commanded to have respect for her husband. That's what Scripture teaches. And so we'll look at that in some more detail because I know questions arise at, at, at that comment, but that's a fact. And so as this is being presented to us in Scripture, the wife is to show respect to the husband, and she is to submit. So in this passage, God clearly commands Christian wives to do two things. Submit to your own husbands and respect them. Now, notice with me, the command for wives to submit to their husband is something that is not just here, it's repeated in Scripture. Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. So this is a command found repeated in the New Testament. He did not say, Wives, be submissive to someone else's husband. He said, Be submissive to your own husband. And so he's speaking concerning the way a home is supposed to work. Now notice, as we begin, the word submit. Let's define that so we can see how we can apply that. You see, the Greek word translated submit, also translated by the word subject, is an interesting word that is used in two basic ways. First, the word is what is called a Greek military term. And the word means to arrange troop divisions under the command of a leader. The second way that the word submit is used is in reference to a voluntary attitude of cooperation. It speaks of yielding or carrying a burden. And so we are to voluntarily submit ourselves to leadership as well as one another. You see, in the church, submission to proper authority is required of all believers. James chapter 4, verse 7 says that all believers are submitted to God. Hebrews 13, 17 says believers are submitted to biblical leadership. Romans 13, verse 1 says we are to be submitted to government. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul said that we are submitted to one another in the fear of God. And so submission is part of just being part of a community. And it's just part of what is necessary for that community to actually function properly. And submission is made possible when the body of Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit. Because without the strengthening of the Lord, my natural response will always be rebellion. 
So I need a model, and the model of submission that we find in Scripture is Jesus himself, because he was perfectly submitted to his Father. In John 4, 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In John 6, 38, Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so Jesus is the model of submission. Submission is the way that things operate most smoothly. And in marriage, submission is rooted in two basic things. One, in the revelation that the church is the bride of Christ and thus is subject to him. And you saw that in chapter 5 here, in verses 31 and 32. And also, it is rooted in the priority of creation. That man was created and then the woman. In 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9, it says, Man is not from woman, woman from man. Nor was man created for woman, but woman for the man. So with that in mind, Paul is giving a command to the wives. And he says it in verse 24 when he says, Just as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So as, as the church is subject to Jesus. So the question has to be asked, why is that so difficult? Or is it? Perhaps I have wives in here who say, this, this doesn't apply to me because I just so easily flow with everything. I never have a problem. So to you problem wives, or you who like to have theory, why is it hard? Why is it so difficult to submit? Why is it so anger-provoking? And why, if I gave this message, we'll say, to uh, any other organization, uh, like, a, like a, a woman's club, after they finished beating me, do you think they'd like what they heard? <laughs> I mean, why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult because you and I, we all will uh, we'll all say it is true that it, it is difficult. It is difficult to submit. But why? Why is it so hard? Well, it originates, this difficulty originates in human nature. When Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, sin entered the world and curses were given. When you read the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 16, it, it reads to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, I, I mention this quite often whenever I look at this passage, especially where it says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. And every lady in this room who's given birth would say that that's true. I, I'm going to assume that. Now, perhaps I have... Somebody in this room who's had children and did not go through birth pangs. Maybe I do. There are some women who seem to have an easier time delivering than others. And maybe you didn't have what you've heard are those, those incredible birth pangs and all. But I have to tell you, it, it is a absolutely true. The women, when they go through birth, they have sorrow. Jesus said it. When a woman goes through labor, she has sorrow. But after she's given birth... Her sorrow is immediately forgotten for the joy that a child has been brought into the world. And that's absolutely true. And there I am with Marie. And Marie is going through birth pangs with our first child, my first child, Corinne. And so as Marie is going through birth pangs with her, she, she actually, you know, she had gotten up and uh, early in the morning she said, my water has broken. I had no clue what that meant. My water has broken. But she did, and she said, we have to get to the hospital. I do remember putting her in the car and driving her to the hospital. She had 33 hours of labor. Now, we had gone through this amazing course called Lamaz, which takes away all the pain. <laughs> and I still remember that she's there on that gurney. They've, they've hooked her up with this, uh, various things and all. And the nurse has approached me and has said to me, your wife is, is in a lot of pain. She just will not admit that she's in it. May I have permission to give to her something that will relieve some of the pain she's going through? And so I gave permission. You see, what had happened is we had gone through this Lamaze, and I knew the hee-hee, ha-ha, hoo-hoo, and all of that. 
and it cost me $25 at that time to learn to do that. And I remember that we're there, and I'm watching this monitor, and it's starting to show contractions and the pain, and it just goes up like that. I remember being seated, and she's on the gurney. Her face is towards me, and I draw my chair up close to her, and I'm about six inches from her, and, I, and I'm looking at her in her face, and I say to her, okay, baby, it's time to hee-hee. And she grits her teeth, this angel from heaven. <laughs> she gritted her teeth, and, and her eyes began to bulge. And she said, stop breathing in my face. Shut up <laughs> and sit back. And I'm thinking, oh, 25 bucks to get yelled at. I got yelled at at home for free. A guy I know had eaten a tuna fish sandwich. Yeah. And his face was right in front of his wife. Okay, honey. Oh, think about that for a minute. So I, can, I, I bear witness that there is pain in delivery. And I don't care if you hee-hee, ha-ha, hoo-hoo, if you have them in a bathtub with warm water, I, it doesn't matter. There is pain in delivery. So if it is true that there is pain in delivery, why is it not true that your husband, that you will desire to rule your husband? Because that's what he's saying here. Your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. Your desire is going to be the run to run the show. But I'm giving authority to your husband through priority of creation and because it is a type of Christ and his church. And even as the bride, the church, is submitted to Christ, the husband, even so in marriage, the wife, is to be submitted to the husband who represents Jesus in that type. That's the point. So there's something in human nature that causes us to rebel. It's a sin nature. And in relationships is also demonstrated through a desire to rule. And yet God says, but for order and proper function, there needs to be a leader because any body with two heads is not proper. There has to be one head, one leader, even as Christ is the head of the church. Even so, God has placed man to be in the role of leadership in the home. You see, when the Bible says, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you, the word desire means intense craving. The same word is used when Cain butchered his brother Abel. And God spoke in Genesis 4, 7 to Cain after his offering was refused, and this is what God said. He said, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. You should rule over it. The word desire, sin wants to dominate. You have to be aware of that and control that. So, when a husband's desires do not violate Scripture and do, does not violate what is proper, then you simply need to remember that he's the one who is accountable before God because he's been vested with the responsibility of leadership. It's interesting how that when, uh, when God was speaking to Abram and Sarah was in a tent and God said that Sarah was going to conceive and give birth, Sarah began to laugh. And she laughed within herself, shall I have pleasure in my old age? And God says to Abram, why did Sarah laugh? That is interesting to me in that it was Sarah who was laughing. Why didn't God just speak to Sarah? He didn't. He spoke to Abram. Why did your wife? And that gives to us the insight from the very beginning that the husband has the accountability before God. And thus that should cause me as a husband to greatly desire to be a proper leader, but it also places on my wife the understanding that God has vested the husband with leadership, and thus I am accountable for the kind of leadership that I provide for the home. Now, spiritual maturity is revealed by a willingness to obey the Lord. 
because obedience is always the earmark of a believer. In 1 John 5, 3, John said it like this. He said, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not difficult. They're not grievous. And so there's an accountability here I have before God, and my wife submits to me as I lead her in the ways of the Lord. Now, the husband is the head of the wife, like Jesus is the head of the church. And even so, as we are submitted to Christ, even so wives are submitted to their husbands. Now, obviously, husbands are first to be submitted to the Lord, and that can help us to be a good husband. So as I submit to the Lord, wives recognize the leadership of that husband. Someone says, but wait a minute, what, what happens when my mate is not saved or is lukewarm? Uh, should I just lay the law down on him? Uh, should I seek somebody else? What should I do? I had a woman in this fellowship who asked me about that one time. What should I do? Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 13, uh, Paul said, A woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. And so you don't just go out and find somebody who loves the Lord. But Peter gives us insight into how to make it possible to have a good marriage when he writes concerning the same subject in 1 Peter 3. So let's turn on Bibles there now, and let me take you to and conclude our study here by looking at verses 1 through 6 in 1 Peter chapter 3. And you may be saying... Um, I knew it turned in my Bible someplace. Where is 1 Peter? 1 Peter is just before 2 Peter. That'll help you. <laughs> it's right after James. So in 1 Peter 3, beginning at verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your beauty be that outward adorning of, of arranging the hair, of wearing gold, or of putting on fine apparel. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, the apostle gives us insight into marriage and again the wife's role. Notice with me that Peter is sharing concerning Christian wives. He especially is writing concerning them being married to unbelieving husbands. But the principles that he gives apply to marriage in general. He begins with the wife because her situation was far more difficult. You see, during that day, if a husband was saved, he just went to church, and the wife would go automatically with him. She couldn't refuse. But if the wife got saved, it could be dangerous for the wife because during that day, she had no rights. So her situation was far more difficult. There were religious as well as cultural rules that were established that were considered acceptable in society. And so for a Jewish woman, for a Jewish woman to change her religion, well, that was simply unthinkable. They just didn't do that. In the Greek society, a man could have a lover, and he would have that lover for pleasure. But he would have a wife, a wife that would raise the children and would care for the home. And in Greek society, her duty was to remain indoors, to be obedient, and to remain attractive to that man. In Roman culture, the wife had no rights. Under law, she was always regarded as a child. Before marriage, she was under her father's power. He had the power of life and death. That right automatically was transferred to her husband when she got married. So the entire atmosphere of ancient civilization was that a woman was incapable of caring for herself. And you can see how dangerously brave she was when she came to faith in Jesus Christ. With that in mind, Peter begins to instruct. Notice with me in verse 1, 1 Peter 3, he says, You wives be submissive to your own husbands. 
that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Notice how he begins. He does not say divorce him. He does not say argue with him. He doesn't even say preach to him. He says be submissive to him. Why? Well, that was the only way possible that she might win her husband to Christ. By submitting her life to Jesus and her husband, she may possibly win him. And Peter is actually starting, as, as sometimes we forget today, by putting eternity in view for the woman. She needs to understand that though she may not have the marriage that she wants, this unbelieving man is going to go to hell if he doesn't come to faith. And so he begins by placing eternity before her and reminds her of the value of the soul of that man. Now, sometimes these, these husbands, and, and he speaks of that, are not really open to, uh, to the things that the Lord is doing in your life. Notice how he says in verse 1, he says that even if some do not obey the word, the, word, the words do not obey carry with it the, the meaning of aggressively disobey. It's not, in other words, that they just passively say, uh, whatever's good for you is fine with me, I don't really care. That's not what he's talking about. There are husbands like that. There are husbands who say to their wife, you can be involved in church, I don't have a problem with that. You can take the kids to church, that's good, it makes them better, I don't have a problem with that. You want to go to a woman's study, that's fine. You want to go to a woman's conference, that's okay. You're going to take off for a week into a conference, I don't have a problem with that. And there are, there are many men like that who, who are very neutral in that way. They think that it does their wife good and thus it's doing them good and they don't care. But there are the other husbands that I have met who, who aggressively disobey. It's not that, they have, that, that they're neutral at all. It's that they're really opposed. They, they don't like the fact that the wife is changed. They don't like the fact that she doesn't want to go to Vegas and spend the weekend gambling and partying and drinking. He doesn't like that anymore. He doesn't like the fact that, that she doesn't dress provocatively the way he used to like her to dress. He doesn't like the way that she comes to church, gets involved, brings the kids. I, I remember a fellow who was telling his wife as she was coming here in this church, he told his wife, I don't want you taking my kids to that church. I want them taken to my church. Well, the fact is he never went to his church. But that's what he was saying. I don't want the kids in your church. If we take them to church at all, we go to my church. But he never went to church because he was so aggressively disobedient. So that happens. It's not that, they, it's not that they're neutral at all. There are some husbands who will complain and will be upset and they're mad and, and then they feel that you've changed. You're not the same person. I don't like it. That's who he's speaking about. This is a person who's upset about it all the time. So what happens? I mean, they may want you to sin. They may want you to sin so strongly. They have such a great desire for you to sin and all of that. It's that insistence that sometimes they can have. Well, notice what he says. Without a word, they may be won by the conduct of the wife. You see, again, in most marriages, I can't speak for everyone, but in most marriages, wives may not have headship, but they certainly have influence. My wife has tremendous influence in my life. I, I mentioned to you that we don't argue. It, it, it's not that we don't have differences. It's that I've, I've learned to read my wife. So if I'll say something like, you know, I think I'd like to do this, she doesn't say anything. She just looks at me. And it's that look. And I'll go, what? Because I know she's yelling at me. She just isn't saying anything. She's disagreeing. And she'll do that, and I'll say, so you don't think that's a good idea? It's so funny. I mean, and I think about it, if I was watching a film of it, because I'll say, I think we, we ought to do this, and she won't say anything. Then I'll look at her. Okay, you don't agree with that, huh? She didn't say anything. I said, I know you don't. Okay, what is it? What's wrong with it? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's like I'm reading her mind. It's odd. So that's what I mean, and we don't argue. Not verbally. <laughs> she has learned when she doesn't think a decision that I think is a good one, when she doesn't think it's a good decision, you know, my wife, this is the truth. That I, please forgive me. It could sound unreal to, to some, in, but it's, just, it's true. This is how my wife is. She deals with, she prays. She prays. And God changes my heart. The scripture says the king's heart is in the Lord's hand, like rivers of water. He turns it whithersoever he wills. 
My wife will take these disagreements in her heart if she thinks I'm making a bad decision, and she'll give them to the Lord. And God turns my heart. And by the way, husbands, you'll know it when your wife's praying for you. And I come up to my wife, and I will do this, and this may not sound real to you, it's the truth, and I will say to her, you know, you were right. I know what you're saying is right. Because I do take it before the Lord also. And he joins our heart in the right decisions. And that's what safeguards us in our marriage. It's learning to not argue over non-essentials, to pray about everything, to come together, and to agree that this is best for us. And there are times when the husband is won without a word by the conduct of the wife. You may want him to get saved so badly that you go and do all the presets on his radio in his car to K-Wave, everyone. Or you may be the kind of person who makes sandwiches if, if he takes a lunch and, and he opens it up and he starts to eat it and he puts his sandwich down open and there's a piece of paper, man does not live by bread alone. <laughs> it, it, it may be that you do that. You know, constantly preaching at a certain point. Every husband in, you know this, ladies. You know it's true. Every husband in this room knows how to look at you and not listen simultaneously. We all do. We just know when her mouth stops, I'm supposed to nod. It usually takes three minutes. We're not listening to you. We're thinking, what time is the game on? Do I have time? To? That's what we're thinking. And so the arguing and trying to fight and trying to win us with the constant preaching, once you have shared, now live, that he may be won without a word, without her preaching to him as he observes you. The word observe I mentioned to you is a strong Greek word. It's a word that, that we would say, like the, it's a concentrated gaze, like an instant replay gaze where he's watching the game and there's an instant replay and he's watching it. We watch our wives that way. Husbands, the way that we love them is we learn them. And so for me, I have learned my wife. I will watch her. I'll know when she's sad when, before she says that. I, I know when she's blessed before she says I know these things because I watch her very closely. And that's what he, he's saying. The husbands observe the wife. They closely scrutinize her. They get to know her. And so they find out what's important to her. And what are they observing? Well, he says they're observing two things. They're observing your chaste behavior. The, the word chaste means to be pure from carnality. It speaks of modesty and innocence, a purity from every fault. Song of Solomon 4 verse 7 says it like this. You are fair, my love. There is no spot in you. And it says also accompanied by fear. This fear can speak of the fear of God, can be speaking of the respect that he, that he has shown by his wife. So, this respect, I've mentioned it to you a moment ago. I'll say it again. I'll say it briefly. You know, it, it seems that it may be a little more common today than, than it was in the past. It, I, I think it is. Where, where husbands very often are, are, are made fun of. Uh, that Husbands very often are portrayed, and I see it not every time, but a lot, that the man is regarded as so inferior and so stupid I mean, we don't even know how to go to the store to buy things. We come home and it's the wrong this and, oh, I've got to go back now. And the wife says, yes, because I got the wrong dish soap. You know, and we're just so inept and so many commercials. It's very insulting. It's very insulting. And, and yet there are many people who, uh, who actually portray husbands as being kind of just like odd and weak and, and, and all. And, and, and I have seen it. I have, I have seen the culture change in its regard for the men. I have seen it in my lifetime. And, and now some of you are too young to know this, but I'll use this as an illustration anyway. You know, when I grew up, there were shows on television that, that had families. So you can still see them in classics, you know, Ozzie and Harriet. You can see Leave it to Beaver. You can see shows like that. And, um, and uh, uh, these shows that I grew up with showed great respect for the father. The father always had a job. He was always working hard for the family, respected by the mom. Well, that's not what, that, the way it is now, is it? 
I mean, we're, we're regarded as being just kind of dumb. We can't even, you know, we can't even drive. I mean, there's a commercial where these two people are speaking about getting in a crash. We had a perfect driving record. And then the woman says, until someone got in an accident. And then he kind of, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm the doofus, you know. And, and, and I, I see these commercials or, or I see the commercials with these young guys wearing Burger King hats saying, oh, someone's going to get in trouble. And, and I, I think, you know, you've got to get a life. Move out of your dad's basement. And, uh, and, and for me, I, I, I see this and I think, you know, this, this is how we're regarded as weak and indecisive, as needing somebody to tell us what to buy and when to come in and where to go out. And it's just odd and it just plays into this. And, and the bottom line is there's just a lot of disrespect and I've seen it. And one of the things that, that I will say in, is a, as a praise to my mom and my dad is, is uh, I, I, I can't remember when I grew up in that home, I don't remember seeing my mother disrespect my father. Now, my mom wasn't saved the first 25 years of the marriage, but I just don't remember my mom ever, ever disrespecting my father. She showed him respect. I grew up in that home where the mother said, that's your father. She said it like that. That's your father. You respect him. And if you don't respect him, I will teach you to respect. Now, that was my mom. She'd bring out her, her, her chancla and she'd bring out and bang. It's all over. Her slipper. Or anything she could get her hand on. I mean, my mom. My mom was real strong about that. She really was. See, so my, my mom respected my dad. And so naturally, I just grew up thinking that's natural. And it's not. It's not. There are, there are numbers that I have seen just in conversations where the wife mocks the husband, disrespects him, says something in front of the kids. And, and there have been times when Marie and I have exchanged glances like that wasn't a good thing. She shouldn't have said that about him. That made him look real small. And that is something that a husband, it'll, you can either build him up, ladies, or you can just tear him down. And the more you make him feel small, remember, there may be somebody out there who's going to make him feel tall. Remember that. And so it's a very wise thing to show respect, to not put him down, to not ridicule him. Because as I mentioned, uh, the way that I spell love is really the word respect. Again, that is made possible by the Spirit of the Lord. As he's speaking about this, they observe your chaste conduct, he says in verses 3 and 4. Do not let your beauty be that outward adorning of arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Again, the Greek woman having a lot of time on her hands would spend a lot of time in front of a, in, in front of a mirror of sorts, and she'd put on makeup, she'd dress up, she played dress up. That's what she did. And, and Peter is saying that there are better ways to use your time than to get caught up with always just putting on makeup. He's saying the godly woman makes best use of her time. You see, a godly wife doesn't place all emphasis on outward beauty, and she doesn't intend to draw attention to herself. Like it says in Proverbs 31:25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. It doesn't mean that she doesn't care for her appearance. Of course she does. She just doesn't present herself in an immodest way. It's like what Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.9 when he said, I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent, appropriate clothing, not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. In other words, she doesn't dress to draw undue attention to herself. She doesn't desire to attract the attention of men and she's not in competition with other women. Her beauty is reserved for her husband. He is not saying, and I'll say this quickly and move on, he's not saying that, that a woman should not wear makeup. I thank God. <laughs> for makeup. She 
She takes off her wig, takes off her false eyelashes, removes her lipstick, takes off the rouge, removes her girdle, <laughs> and says to her husband, I want to talk to you about the way you're not always real with me. <laughs> he's not saying he's not saying you can't wear makeup ladies he's not saying I, I, why am I even bringing that up uh, one te to tease with you because I like to forgive me but two because there are churches that teach that the women have to wear dresses that they cannot put makeup on they cannot wear jewelry and that is not what Peter or Paul was saying what they're speaking about is the heart because somebody once said, and there's some truth to this, that one of the saddest things he ever sees is when a beautiful woman grows older. Because if she has put all of her attention on outer appearance, what happens when a younger woman comes in the room? What happens when she's used to be in the center of attention for her beauty, but now some prettier woman's in the room? And if she's wasted a lifetime trying to retain a youthful appearance and not growing in godliness, she has not valued what really matters. Because, you see, what makes a husband's heart safely trust in the wife is her virtue, not her outer appearance. In that, he safely trusts because she's an honorable woman. And that's how it works. Some of you men saw your girl who became your wife, and when the first time you saw her, you said, She's just good looking. I would like to be with her. I understand that because we see good. We don't hear that well, but we can see good. When I met Marie, I did not have that experience. When I met Marie, my wife, I was attracted to her personality. And I can tell you what attracted me was her personality and her smile. And I didn't look at her as a, a potential mate. I just looked at her as a person. And when I saw her as a person, I saw the beauty of her heart long before I realized that she had a beauty that I would find very attractive. And that is what has kept me with this woman all of these years, is that heart that she has. And that's what, that's what Peter is saying. It is the hidden person of the heart. It's the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. He goes on and finally says, for in this manner in former times, Holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so, because charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, the Bible says a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. When speaking of Sarah, I want you to see this, and we'll close with this. I want you to notice that it says, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Two things, and we'll close. Marie and I were dating. We were moving towards marriage. We were taking a drive that was a few hours. So I said to her, we ought to read the Bible. She said, that'd be good. What do you want to read? And I said, let's read 1 Peter chapter 3. So she's reading it. She gets to verse 6. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I said, wait, 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 wait. What? What does the Bible say there, Marie? And she read it again. Obeyed him, calling him Lord. I said, oh, I like that. I like that. And I told her, I said, my name's not David. My name is Lord. Well, that didn't work. But what is that all about? What are you talking about here? That shows again the respect and reverence that she had for this man. Now here's something for you sometimes. Ladies will say, but he does not deserve my respect. You see, the Bible tells us that uh, we're to submit unto the Lord, uh, unto our husbands, the scripture says, as to the Lord. And I still remember one woman saying to me, when he becomes like the Lord, I will submit to him. <laughs> Fact. And I said, which means you never will, right? On this side of, of heaven, he's never going to be like the Lord. We're talking about a, a, a choice to submit. Even as you submit to God, it's reflected in the way that you submit to your husband. 
But, let's remember something as we close. Let's remember that Abraham is introduced to us in Genesis 12 as, in this way, how that, the Lord had said to him to get up and to move out of where he was to a land that he was going to give him. And he got up and began to move out. As he moved out, he entered into Egypt. When he entered into Egypt, it was brought to the attention of Pharaoh that a very beautiful woman had come in with a man named Abram. And so Sarah was taken to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh wanted to take her as a part of his harem. You see, Abram said, she's my sister. And that's what got them in that big problem. He was afraid that harm would be done to him for the beauty of his wife. And so they had a big problem, and it's just sorted out there in the book of Genesis where God intervenes and nothing is done to Sarah. But later on, you would think he, he had learned something. That, that took place when he was around 75. When he was around 100 uh, again, uh, there he is, and he's in a place called Gerar, and there's a one uh, named Abimelech there, and Sarah was a beautiful woman, even at that age, hard to believe, but she was given the ability to, uh, at 100, I mean, at 90, come on. But... Um, but she was given strength, and, and it's very possible that her body was, was revitalized. I mean, she's going to give birth. and all. But the scripture says that, once again, she was a very beautiful woman. And uh, they took Sarah and brought her to Abimelech. And God, God began to deal with Abimelech and let him know, you have another man's wife. And so Abimelech comes and speaks to, to Abram about it, and, and they sort that problem out. But on two occasions, Genesis 12, Genesis 20, Abram put his wife in danger. She could have been taken. She wasn't because God intervened. And yet, the scripture says, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. So maybe, maybe that decision to respect that man comes as a decision because the Lord says that's the best way to win him. I would like to be respectable in every moment of my life, but I'm a human being and it's quite obvious that I can't be. But my wife still shows respect. Pretty sure that not everybody in this room has gone through things similar to Sarah. Perhaps there are some who have. And yet she's given to us as an example, Abram Sarai, that's the original names. Abram means high father. Sarai, dominator. Abraham, father of many nations. Sarah, princess. How did dominator become princess? How did that happen? By showing respect and love to her husband, she learned to become a different woman entirely and was even named a different name by God himself. Sarah, at one time, you who were so insistent, you said go into Hagar and bring forth children, and Ishmael was the product of that. With your domination and your rulership and your attempt to run the show with your husband, some bad decisions were made. But you learned to call him Lord. And now I can call you princess. How did that happen? By yielding to the Lord, learning to submit, and respecting God and the man God placed in her life. Sounds simple, huh? But it's not. It requires dying to self, the power of the Holy Spirit, and constant prayer that God will hear your cry, especially for those who are married to men who aggressively disobey God. But God does answer prayer, and that's why we keep praying.